you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you need a bit of a reset. There, there is a possibility on the other side of this that that uh, inflation could be could actually be quite low. The great foreclosure bailout. Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. I have a great collaboration today with Melody Wright. One of the things that I love about Melody is she has really great perspective on what's going on behind the scenes, whereas I have a lot more perspective when it comes to actual the front end of things and consumers. So I think this is going to be a really great collaboration, guys. And if you guys found value in the podcast, don't forget to go to Melody's YouTube channel, Melody Wright. She has very wonderful perspective here. And if you want additional perspective from Melody, go to her Substack. I'm subscribed to her Substack. She's a wonderful writer, you guys. I'm absolutely jealous of her writing skills. You guys know, unfortunately, I'm with the Slow Reading Group. How However, without further ado, Melody, how are you today? I'm doing well, Travis. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm a little bit worried about the storm here coming up right in the front end of our road trip. I know. Uh, so, uh, Melody, just for the sake of time, you know, first of all, I just want to say I really value your time. Thank you for joining us, uh, you know, the viewers and I today to share your perspective. I think it's, you know, very admirable of you. You're trying to spread warning. You're trying to spread additional, you know, perspective. Things aren't all great, right? And, you know, there's a huge misconception out there on what's going on with foreclosures exactly. Is the government bailing them out? Are there foreclosure moratoriums? So today we'll talk about that. But before I do, Melody, can you explain to the viewers that don't know who you are, you know, what do you do for a living? What is it that you do behind the scenes as it relates to servicing? <laughs> um, behind the scenes, I still, I have a strategy and consulting company. Um, and so I, I do, we do a, a, a bunch of different things, but one thing I do is called subservicer oversight. And that's where essentially the originator, um, the, the people that make that loan, be it a bank or non-bank, make a decision to retain the servicing asset. And what is their servicing asset? That's just the, um, ability to take those payments and you get a little fee for that. And so, but part of that originator's responsibility is to make sure uh, their servicer is performing adequately. And that was a big part of the consent orders from way back when in, you know, 2010, 2011. And so we do kind of loan level review. We look at the way the subservicer is handling these loans according to regulatory guidelines um, especially in default, because when once you get to default, there are a ton of rules that you have to follow in order to take that um, final uh, default action, whatever that may be, and you know to help that bars borrower successfully exit from that default situation. So that's yeah. one thing we do. An another thing I do is kind of do create technology, but for this conversation, you know. Um, really the the looking at those servicers and making sure that they're performing the way that they're supposed to, which yeah, is and how honest, I know a lot about default. <laughs> right, right. And honestly, I can use some upgrades in my technology. Maybe we could talk later about that. Um, yeah. But just for the layman's terms, what she's saying, guys, is basically how, okay, just to put this in perspective, I'm on the origination side. I'll help a client, you know, as an example, get a house, the home loan closes, that loan, that mortgage now goes to kind of, you know, Melody's department. So when she says servicing, what she's doing is basically helping people collect the money. So the servicing is like the bank. It's the bank that owns the portfolio of loans that is getting paid off of the interest in the long run. So she has a very special perspective because she sees how that, you know, that huge book of business or loans, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities is performing at various stages of the market. And really the advantage, and I love this about you, Melody, is, is you have a huge you know, hand to the pulse of the regulation as far as, you know, the foreclosure process, but also we don't have to wait on lagging data. You also see potentially defaults before it really hits, you know, potentially mainstream media. So can you tell us, right. Melody, are you seeing an increase in defaults on mortgages? Yeah, so it's a mixed picture. Um, overall and aggregate, yes. Um, but and 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 so back in May, we started to see borrowers go delinquent. We started to see them cross that 30-day threshold, which I call the death cross, because you know, in this country we're obsessed with our credit. Um, when you don't pay your mortgage at day 31, you're reported to credit. And so a lot of people 
uh, don't want that to happen. So when they let it happen, that's a real signal to us. So back in May, we started to see that, especially in FHA, which are kind of your riskier borrowers. And then we saw it over the summer between Fannie and Freddie as well. And what what we are observing is that, you know, we had that uptick in 30-day delinquency, 60-day delinquency, but because of all of the programs out there, they're going to get caught um, because uh, the agency is FHA, VA, uh, they have a lot of rules about what you have to do in those first 60 days of delinquency. Um, and, and you have to offer workout solutions to them. And so by the time they get to the 90 day, typically, if they haven't exhausted their solutions, they kind of get caught up in some type of workout. And, and sometimes they catch them earlier for like a simple repayment. But what I'm seeing this month um, in December data is an increase again in those 30 plus delinquencies and the highest uh, that I've seen since May. And so What's been happening in mainstream media is everybody wants to say, this is the lowest seriously delinquent ever or some such nonsense. Um, but in reality, of course, it's low. We've had incredible COVID bailout programs that are still going on today in some respects um, that essentially you could put on hold paying your mortgage for over 18 months. And at the end of that, you could take that entire balance and put it back at the back end of the loan, like, a, you know, in, an, a, a, in a non-interest bearing lien. And so we shouldn't be seeing any delinquencies right now. I can tell you the ones that I'm seeing are the ones that have, have did the forbearance. They did that partial claim at the back. They did the 40 year mod and they still, and modification, sorry, and they still can't pay. And the other folks that we're seeing going all the way past that 90 days right now are kind of your, um, what I'll call the fraudster class, are the investors mm -hmm. that maybe took on a loan but uh, to try and rent it out, but they said it was going to be owner-occupied. So that's why we're not seeing seriously delinquency in the media. We should not be seeing. But what's concerning is all this early stage uh, delinquency we've been seeing since the summer. Uh, that's showing that the consumer is in distress. But as with everything, Mainstream media kind of picks what it wants to say and and what they're trying to give the message out there because we're in an election year is that delinquency is not that bad. But again, it's kind of like saying inflation isn't that bad. And then you go to the grocery store and it's like, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, it just to just to clarify, too, as well, Melody, just for the viewers, what she's saying as far as death crosses, when you have a 30 day mortgage late payment on your your credit is very, very devastating to your credit score. Your credit score can drop 80 to 100 points, and that's just a 30-day late. You guys, normally that just keeps extending to 60 days to 90 days. So that's a situation to where even if these homeowners, you know, get out of the foreclosure, their credit is burned. They, you know, just because there's these foreclosure moratoriums doesn't mean those people didn't get wrecked. Yes, they're still in their houses because of these moratoriums, but their ability, their purchasing power is, I mean, there's no other way to put this, but it's shot, it's trash, it's its no longer it's good. And also, what she, yeah, and that's what she means by the death process. And another thing what she's saying is, and, and clarify this, Melody, is, you know, we, first of all, we shouldn't be seeing foreclosures. Right. We, we've had these moratoriums extended. We have massive equity growth, but we are still seeing defaults. So you I believe we could safely assume that the reason for the defaults is unaffordability. Would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, two things. And, and, and I agree. And something I want to mention, I forgot, is we also still have these half programs or homeowner assistant funds. Oh. These are the other things that are pulling people out of delinquency. And listen, guys, I'm not against people who are struggling getting help, but we've got, we had 10 billion at the start of the year. There's about 5 billion left. Um, the state's got this money to help people with things like down payment or to help them if they're struggling, help them with all kinds of things. And so that's why we really shouldn't see these delinquencies. But yes, it's due to unaffordable an affordability on the FHA or kind of that the the borrower I described who's exhausted all their options. It really is that they never could have afforded that home in the first place. And with the increases in property taxes, insurance, um, that is just it, it, it's stressing them out to no end. And then if you need a repair, I mean, it's just you as you know as uh, and our friend Todd talks about a lot that 
cost of ownership is really high and a lot of people don't think about what it takes to maintain a property. Now, on the other side of it, I'm the investor. Um, I'm a mom and pop investor. I, you know, I maybe bought a couple of homes um, and I, you know, had a certain rate of return. And now with interest rates where they were and the leverage that I've taken on, um, that leverage is costing me a lot more money at the same time that property taxes and insurance are increasing. And so, and then they're also cost of repairs and ownership, especially if they're renting that property out, you know, it, things just tend to break, <laughs> with, yeah. you know, with renters, et cetera. So, you know, both, both situations are about unaffordability. Yeah, I mean, you know, as a mortgage loan officer of over two decades, especially when it comes to FHA, most people are purchasing homes maxed out. And unfortunately, the DTI debt to income ratio for FHA with AUS approvals, 56.99% of someone's gross income, you know, going toward their expenses. So what happens is, is when they get these, you know, surprise tax bills that, you know, the taxes can go up $400, $500 a month, especially if you're in Texas. Uh, that's special to Texas. We have high property taxes. But not only that, as a result of the massive equity increase, the homeowner's insurance and the declaration pages and all these types of things are going up. And that really hurts people, Melody, especially if, if people are on a fixed income or if people just remain making the same amount of money, if the wages aren't right. keeping up with the inflation, you know, it's hurting people. So the people from what you're saying is people that we see defaults right now are, are struggling homeowners. And some of those homeowners may have, and correct me here, Melody, may have two, three, four, five percent interest rate and still can't afford uh, to pay. But one thing I want to highlight that you said, um, basically, you you talked about the HAP programs, right? You said basically start this year, we had 10 billion. We have about half of that now. And I just wanted to make clear where this is an addition to whatever the existing moratoriums are. Like we have the VA moratorium, FHA has extended their moratorium. These are additional programs that the state has to potentially help people out of foreclosures. Is that correct? Yeah. And so just a clarification, FHA hasn't extended a moratorium yet on foreclosures. VA has, but you know, they still have their COVID relief options where you can take that partial claim we were talking about. But but yes, the answer is yes. This is in addition to all of those previous programs. Here's what I got from HUD right here. So, you know, and I think this this is really what I meant. It looks like they extended the, the COVID related uh, forbearance programs. And basically, it's basically saying um, borrowers will not participate in a COVID forbearance plan who are 90 days or more delinquent through October 30th of 2024. Does that mean that prior to October 30th, 2024, someone can still qualify Melody for one of these, you know, COVID forbearance programs? What my understanding is what they have, um, what they've extended is actually just the, uh, the COVID-19. See that second yeah. thing you've highlighted there. Right. So yes. that's still available. Um, now, a forbearance is always a, an option. It's usually only 90 days, though. But what they've extended is that kind of COVID-19. It, it was a combination partial claim modification program. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, that's so crazy to me. But on, but on a nationwide level, they have the foreclosure moratoriums through the lockdowns and COVID ended November, th the end of November in 2023, correct? Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I started reading what I you got were you, saying. Melanie. <laughs> no, you're good. No. Uh, yeah, it, it, it all got extended until, you know, no, the end of November 2023. And okay. then, but what they're saying, which is different from the VA, is that, um, they're giving that that big partial claim um, relief yes. where you could put all of those foreborn payments at the back of the loan. And this is the difference from VA and what um, they did not get that extension. And that's why they put foreclosures on a moratorium for any VA loan, because uh, people said VA should have asked for the extension. VA says we couldn't. We didn't have the authority that would have had to be Congress. Who knows who's right? But at the end of the day, they didn't extend it like FHA did. And so that's why Biden came out and essentially um, put the moratorium on any foreclosure action for VA loans. And that goes till May. But there's it's very confusing, these things, when they say till this day or this day, because typically, you know that they have this rule of 
everything, you can't do anything 120 days after the covered period. But put it this way, uh, that VA moratorium means that, you know, veteran loans will not go into a foreclosure situation until right before the election. Yeah, I was going to, that was my next thing. Um, So do you think he did it to be a good person or uh, because there's election? But don't answer it. I want to go on to the next thing. Okay, so before we talk about DSCR loans, and I know you want to talk about that because holy smokes, that's definitely the next subprime for investors. Um, but let's first go over, you know, whether or not you think, you know, as two people that went through the GFC, right, and we were in the industry in, in some aspect or another, you know, my question to you is going to be: Is FHA the new subprime loan? But before you answer that, let me show the viewers a few things, okay? And, and why I would ask this. Now, the first thing I want to show the viewers is the delinquency rate of subprime loans is, you know, is far greater than any other loan, conventional, GSC, VA, port- even portfolio, which is very interesting, probably because there's more liquidity in portfolio loans and more down payment required. Uh, but the delinquency rate right now is for FHA is high. You could say it's uh, around, I think, 2006 levels, which is right here. Uh, so we're sitting at you know pre-GFC delinquencies. <laughs> and people don't realize that, again, we're sitting at like Pre GFC, right before we went into the financial crisis, we're seeing yeah, the Q3, same delinquency Q4 rate. Of and, and then the other yeah. now guidelines are stronger because of the Dodd Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act that was passed in 2009, making qualified mortgages. But the thing is, and what that means, guys, is back then you can state your income; you didn't have to prove it. But the thing is, is even though we have stricter regulations, the debt to income ratio for FHA is is through the roof. It's almost, you know, it's almost 46 percent. If you look at conventional, conventional is under 38. So, you know, debt to income ratio for FHA is absolutely out of control. The delinquency is absolutely out of control. So is FHA the new subprime, Melody? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I've i been um, doing for some clients what we call early payment default reviews. And this is where um, a loan goes into default within the first year of origination, which should never happen if it was underwritten properly. And, you know, we're seeing a ton of that. And the credit profiles of these folks, Travis, I can't even believe and and I know you say, yeah, you know, credit quality improved after Dodd Frank. It, I think what I would argue is that people got better at making it look like credit quality <laughs> improved, but that certainly is not the case for these FHA and VA programs who require very little down payment, um, if any. <clears throat> they can often offer what's called a silent second on the back of it. Um, And the credit. I mean, I think people today would be very shocked if they saw the credit scores in these. uh, And we know that credit scores were actually inflated, but these borrowers didn't need uh, basically a 620, maybe a 580. You and I have talked about that, you know, Travis, depending. And recently I've seen that when helping out clients and doing the reviews of these early payment defaults, people with prior foreclosures. People with, um, and and in the last six years, people with open uh, delinquent electricity accounts, delinquent cell phone accounts at time of origination. This is not something I I saw even back in the GFC, to be honest with you. So, yes, I would say it's it's the new subprime. And I think all you have to do is really look at the credit score um, and the lack of ability to repay, just like you're saying and explaining to everyone about debt to income. You know, what everybody's focused on is can they make the payment today? Well, and, you know, they're not looking at their total what they owe for their student loans. They're looking at what they're paying each month. And a lot of people are on that, you know, income based repayment plan. But if there's any life event, you don't even have to lose your job. You know, what if your roof, there's some sort of repair you need to do or your car breaks down? That's going to send you into a default situation right away. So is it the subprime of the lower credit quality borrowers? Absolutely. And then we've seen, in addition, similar to last time, where subprime equal non-traditional products, we've seen a lot of investors using these FHA loans lying on their occupancy affidavits, yes. saying that they plan to live in the home for a year, when in reality, they, they're planning to either do long-term rental or short-term rental. 
which that yeah, I mean, was a big part of some prime last time was the investors. Well, I mean, the way I looked at it last time, subprime was just legal fraud, right? So, you know, fraud has always been in the industry. I have no idea why they still don't stop it, except for like the lender doesn't drive out to the property to make sure that the borrower is living in the house. No one drives out right. to verify that. But but there's and that's why I think it's so easy for them to do Melody. Now, as a loan officer, like things that we do to make sure that doesn't happen is, is we review credit. And if there's a mortgage on there, right, we're like, OK, what's this mortgage? Like, do you swear, put your hand, do you swear uh, under penalty of perjury? But people still lie. And a couple of things that I want to talk about. Uh, first of all, you know, I was thinking, you know, back in the day when I, okay, as far as FICO score, when I was an originator from 2002 to 2008, I remember clearly some of the guidelines and regulations during the GFC. And one of them that will, I will always remember is I could get someone qualified for a loan at a hundred percent loan to value, which means no down payment, stated income at a 580 credit score. So now when I'm like, okay, well, how does that compare to right now? Obviously verification of income is different right now. We have, you know, 4506T transcript verification, uh, but you can get someone qualified on FHA at a 580 credit score right now. You have to prove, you know, income, but right. you could still do it at 56.99% DTI as long as they have compensating factors like a down payment. I'm sorry, a down payment. Yes, you would assume that they would, but a lot of people don't have down payment. They're getting it from right. their parents. <clears throat> uh, so AUS is doing a horrible job and AUS is like a safeguard, guys. It's automated underwriting. A loan officer on the front end could run a file through automated underwriting to make sure that they can afford the house. Uh, but there's huge flaws in there. Another thing, that I like what you said is you're saying that some of these products, some of these loans, they're defaulting within the, within the first year. And I could tell you, being a past branch manager of, of three branches of mortgage, we, you know, again, a branch manager, I was running a P&L, so I had to go line by line all of the numbers and all of the expenditures, and there's so many. Uh, but these one-year buybacks, and this was our company, we would have to pay back all of the commission. If someone defaulted or refinanced or anything happened within the first year of that loan, you know, as the originating lender, not the servicer, the originating lender had to pay that money back to whoever picked mm -hmm. up the loan. And, and, right. and honestly, Melody, if I had two of those a year, devastating uh, to my brain. Just two a year, absolutely devastating. So, you know, I think that those buybacks or, or those defaults in the first year, that's going to really hurt a lot of these regional non-depository banks or, or the mortgage banks. Yeah. Uh, and, and the amazing thing is, is, is that's a domino effect that, that can all spiral so fast out of control, like like we saw in 2007 and then into 2008, boom, now we got 2.5 million people in foreclosure when we just had, you know, 400,000 or five. So right. a lot can happen, you know, so there is, you know, when people stop paying Melody, that's when the whole thing comes crashing down. Now, we have another phenomenon happening right now around America, and it's called DSCR loans. And I just want to make a point that these DSCR loans, they don't have the same protection that QM or qualified mortgage loans, which means you guys, these DS, which is debt servicing coverage ratio and their investment loans, these loans aren't regulated or, you know, they're not being regulated like normal loans, conventional FHA, uh, VA that, that fit under a, a certain guideline. <clears throat> These loans are very, not only risky for the buyers, they're risky for the lenders because as the law is stated in Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, technically some of these guys, if they ever go into foreclosure off of getting a DSCR loan, they go back to lenders and said, you should never have given me this. I could never have afforded this or, or the rental market went down. So your income calculations are wrong. And those lenders don't have protection from a lawsuit. And yet they don't care. Everywhere I look on social media, it's like DSCR, you know, and I, this is crazy. At first I was like, okay, whatever, it's 20% down. There's some collateral in it, but I'm starting to see these DSCR companies, Melody, offer these loans at only 15% down. And you know who's really pushing these loans and getting them is, is like the realtors. If they can't stop buying. You know, we talked about this last time. It's like, everyone's a bunch of crackheads. Just stop buying. Even with nine, 10%. Right. They're getting these houses, and instead of doing long-term rentals, they're they're doing short-term rentals. And so, right. like people in Dallas that were purchasing in Dallas, they're no longer purchasing in Dallas because of the STR bans that are they're coming down the way. And now they're going in places like in Tennessee, where you live, and, and they're purchasing, you know, at nine percent rates, twenty percent down, and they can't even cash flow long-term. So, yeah. can you talk about 
what if all and you may not be seeing this because you may only be looking at uh, i don't know if you're looking at portfolio or non-qm yeah so um, <clears throat> let me just say that dscr non-qm is about five percent of all of mortgage right now um so it's a small group but an important one and and so travis 15 percent i've seen you know only 10 percent down i've seen some interest only, some crazy. And so let me just say there are some responsible DSCR lenders out there. There there are. But what I'm seeing, what you're seeing is just like these desperate attempts to get people into these stated income, all day, ninja loans. <clears throat> That's what yeah. they are, guys. You, you, you know, you can put lipstick on a pig and call it DSCR, but that's what it is. And essentially, you know, it, it it's just what we're seeing is already accelerating defaults. And and unfortunately, a lot of these were underwritten um, on the idea of a certain amount of short-term rental income that's just not playing out. And that was aided by certain technology folks. And, and I say technology loosely. Um, you know, I've talked to these companies, their methodology on how they do their comparables is just horrible. Um, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like for instance, Let's say, and I'm not going to pick on any one of them, but let's just say they they're like, okay, when you want to look at what you might make on a for an average daily rate on that property, we're gonna we're gonna do an average of all the properties that have the same amount of bedrooms in a 20 mile radius. Well, if you're in New York City, that could what? mean right. And I, you know, so I'm just saying because I don't want to pick on anyone specifically. But all of these technology providers had a very rosy view of what you could make uh, in short-term rental. Like, for instance, I, one of my clients had a property that was in default down in Texas, 22 miles south of Austin. If you looked it up in one of these technologies, it would tell you it had an average daily rate of $600, 55% of the time. This was a, a bedroom community of Austin. Absolutely nothing there. No one was getting $600 a day uh, for this little shoebox of a house. And so in many ways, the lenders were also added, um, were not, you know, serviced well by the technology providers. But, you know, it, it's just that gain on sell when you sell it to the investor. And there's a lot of big investors in this space. And I've already seen articles that saying that, you know, non-QM is going to be all that happens this year. Because when you can't get a government loan uh, or backed by one of the the GSEs or FHA VA, you would go out and try to get it through, you know, one of these non-QM lenders. And what you said, Travis, is very important that I don't think people understand. So these are called business purpose loans <clears throat> and the CFPB does not cover them. And all of those things we were talking about that are available as loss mitigation workouts uh, to the borrowers. It, previously is not available to these to these borrowers and so you don't have to wait 120 days to take it to foreclosure you can actually enforce the contract and accelerate the note um, per the contract which is usually around 45 days and so and you don't you can't call up the CFPB and complain which is what you can do with a regular loan and so that's the real difference in these investors I don't think understand they're not going to get the same protections that those other borrowers are going to get that's I mean that's huge right there uh, Melody because it's it's just blowing up right now I mean a lot of people are doing the DSCR and I wanted to tell our viewers kind of just to to refine what we're saying these are loans that investors are using to purchase homes but they don't need to verify their income so the the parameters for income verification are like subprime you don't have to think about what i'm saying guys you don't have to show your income you're qualified for this loan based on how much they think you can get from rent and they're using a process to determine the value of rent doing a 20 mile radius that's absolutely psycho and i say that because everything in real estate is so localized you got the rule should be, Melody, you got to stay in the subdivision to figure out the rent range because different, su like Absolutely. one subdivision may have a, a water Absolutely. slide and a skate park. The other right. subdivision may have a crack house and a meth uh, playground where people smoke a meth at the playground. A substation. So, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> if you're going 20 miles out and you're desperate to make the deal work, say you're an originator and you need to make a commission, you may be only picking data from the subdivision that has the water slide when your property mm -hmm. is in the crackhead subdivision. So 
this is a recipe, you know, this is a recipe for disaster. And you say only 5%, 5% is still a lot it's big. of, of it. That's it's still big. huge. You know, yeah, we're saying 5%, but like, FHA, look, right. Yeah, yeah. So FHA is we're, at 9% delinquency. Non-QM is at 5.1% delinquency. Wow. We're already getting there. And so what you kind of showed there about the low debt to income ratio for the Fannie Freddie, um, but those are triggering early stage delinquency as well now. But, you know, we've got this huge uh, kind of the top 20 percent sort of can mute the picture of what's really going on underneath. And so looking at things just in aggregate are always going to give you a, 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 you know, a bad picture. If you think about the big short real quick, where they're sitting there and, uh, you know, one of them says, what's the ABX <laughs> at? And the guy's like, what's the ABX? And and that is this tracking subprime. And I believe in that movie, it was around 5%. And, and someone said, well, we didn't even know that. Why is nobody talking about that? Um, and, and that's because, you know, when you're not looking, and, and it's just like we say, real estate is local. That's why you cannot understand the housing market by just aggregate numbers alone uh, alone there's things that are bubbling up underneath and this is this is gaining traction and it's gaining it's going quickly i never expected because i came from the industry i went through hell after the gfc trying to implement all of these supposed improvements to underwriting uh, all of that stuff right and so for me, I didn't believe this was possible, to be honest with you. And and I oversaw loan processors up until about October 2021. I missed out on a lot of the late stage when people got desperate and went after this FHA so much. But so I understand when I realized that we were here again, it was very shocking to me as someone coming who went through all of that pain at the end of the last cycle. Yeah, um, you hit the nail on the head. It was, you know, we were supposed to be safe and protected. But what I've noticed is, is you know, since the lockdown, you know, post lockdowns, the guidelines for FHA have not been getting tighter. The guidelines for FHA have been getting looser. We see that with the MIP Agreed. going down to 0.55 instead of, I think it was at like 1%, which means the mortgage insurance. So, it, oh my gosh. And then the credit LLPAs where they're trying to like, spread the fees on over to the people with great credit and then make it cheaper for the people with bad credit. That's the opposite of how they should be doing this. If you're not in a position to weather a storm, which is what we're really warning about here, we're not, we're not trying to pick on people. We're not trying to celebrate a collapse. We're trying to warn people like, hey, the right. cracks are, you can see the cracks. And if you really want to know what's going on, go up to the crack and peer through it. And that's what right. Melody is. Melody is like, like, I can see the crack. You're behind that crack. You right. see that. So right now, Melody, we see cracks in you know, essentially all areas of consumer debt. Essentially all mm -hmm. areas of consumer debt except one. Except one area. And this is the biggest pool of loans. This is conventional. This is I'm talking conventional mortgages now. Well, let's move to there. Now, I don't, you know, as far as foreclosures happening with conventional, I showed you stats, it's about 30% DTI. The delinquency rate is like super low. Oh my God, time to celebrate, right? But, you know, <clears> to <throat> me, and I, and I know you may not, you know, we talked a little bit and, and you're not as, uh, you know, like stuck on this, um, but I think it's really the labor market, the job, and I, you know, the job market is really going to be the telltale sign for conventional mortgages, the people that are well, well off, well qualified. But we just had a recent job report that everyone was celebrating because of three point. 3.7% unemployment. Oh my God, that sounds great. But when we look through the cracks of the labor market and, and Jack, uh, nobody special finance helping with this, we lost 1.53 million full-time jobs in just one month. In just one month, guys, in December. Melody, do you think absent, you know, an employment, an unemployment phenomena, do you think we'll have like a foreclosure phenomenon in conventional mortgages? Absolutely. And and one thing I want to mention too about these aggregate stats is there's this little concept called weighted average. And so, you know, let's say you're higher UPB. Uh, so you're a top 20 percenter, you took out a loan for a million, your your uh, credit score is 800. Your loan counts more uh, in terms of that weighted average than, um, you know, someone like me who went and got a mortgage for like $250,000 yeah. uh, at maybe a credit score of 700. 
you know, my loan, it goes like is less cal- in that calculation. And so that's, we have to think about for a long time, those over performers or the super prime are going to kind of crush down um, any signs of default. But I, yeah, you and I have talked, Travis, everybody is looking for you three to do X, Y, Z. For me personally, we just have to stay on this path. I'm seeing prime yeah. borrowers come under stress. They can't afford the taxes yeah. and insurance. They simply cannot. Yeah. And if they, if even they just lose a couple hours at work, um, but we're at a point because of of inflation and and I, you know, a lot of people debate about what is inflation, a monetary phenomenon. You know, I don't care about any of that stuff. I care about what I have to pay when I go to the grocery store, <laughs> and I care yeah. about. I feel like every time I leave my house, I'm just paying more and more money. And it's like, I just want to stay home. But, you know, and and you're hearing this now, too, from the top 20 percent that they they have said, this is nonsense. I'm not going to spend anymore. Um, And so I believe that if everything stayed constant, we would we would definitely see prime borrowers. We're going to see some of them in June, but I think we'll probably have a couple of ways of this. But listen, I don't think we're going to get that luxury. City just announced 20,000 layoffs this morning. Oh, so my, I what? don't think we're going to have to care about this debate for much longer, Travis. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like I feel like this is inconvenient, you know, like because we're like having to forecast and like looking through the cracks because when it melts down, it's like, it's too late already. Like, so I really hope it that happens it so fast. Yeah. And it's too late. It happens- just like you said. Too fast, too late. And I really hope people appreciate what we're doing here. I mean, I get roasted all the time because because we had a rebound this year. People are like, oh, you're so wrong, Travis. You've been saying this for three years, but I, my YouTube channel has been around. I've been doing this for less than two, but okay. Um, you know, but you said, you know, as long as we stay in this environment, things are going to, I mean, I agree. <laughs> things will fall apart. But that right. brings me to the next thing. That brings me to the bullish narrative, Melody. Are you worried about more bailing out? Are you worried about more moratorium, especially being in that we're in an election year? Oh, it's going to happen a hundred percent. I mean, if we start getting material delinquency in June, and right now they're working on new programs for FHA, and they'll be working on new programs for Fannie and Freddie as well. Uh, but absolutely, I, and I think that not. And I'll put on my tinfoil hat uh, as you know, hat tip to nobody special, but and say that. I believe what we've been seeing with these cybersecurity incidents at, mm. uh, you know, basically loan care at, you know, Fidelity yes. at loan Fidelity. Depot. Yeah. They and got my Fidelity, stuff. Exactly. And they've got like, they got me. Lawsuits. They got you. I went through, they, I went through Fidelity. I was like, I'm cool. Right. And I was like going through some of my closing paperwork. I'm like, oh my God, the first house I bought in Texas was with Fidelity. They have my social, yeah. they have my date of birth. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Gosh, right. that was a huge. And, and so in a huge. way, I think what's happening is, you know, this this is millions and millions of borrowers and nobody's talking about it. And First American, who I come from, you know, deep inside a mortgage, they have so many ancillary services on the back end that people don't even realize they're doing. You know, Data Tree is probably the mm-hmm. most wild, widely used uh, source for getting county records and title records. And so, you know, all of this, I believe what's probably going to happen is um, people are going to say, you know, we really can't trust these non-banks with mortgages anymore. Oh. And, and everybody needs to realize that since the GFC, it's primarily the non-banks that are participating in this space. Your banks, your big banks are going to buy the mortgage box securities. They're going to do some very, uh, you know, specific lending like jumbo lending and just enough to kind of keep the machine going. But in reality, it's your big non-banks like Mr. Cooper, who had a cybersecurity event. Yes. So I just yes. have this feeling <clears throat> that similar to the way that VA went on hold uh, because they made an accusation that Mr. Cooper specifically had told borrowers they would have a certain option or workout at the end of their forbearance that they did not have. And they said, oh, no, servicer issues. We've got to put that on hold. Well, guess why foreclosures went on hold last time in 2011? They went on hold because they said the servicers were not properly servicing. 
And so it's very much the same playbook. And I think that'll be used again. Um, and maybe it'll be like, listen, these guys can't even protect your data. We don't know what's going mm. on. This could have been corrupted. We can't let people go to foreclosure because, you know, I, I just have this feeling there will be, if we start to see really material distress by the end of Q2, there will definitely be moratoriums on foreclosure. And by the way, it won't just have to be the White House, the state AGs got heavily involved last time. Um, it was a way to make a name for themselves and they'll get heavily involved again. And and so, you know, you could have certain states actually go on hold even before a federal mandate is put out. Oh, that's I mean, that's brilliant, you know, because we have seen like I felt like the first time there was like every other week. There was a massive company, you know, that got hacked. So, I mean, that's a very yeah. interesting um, you know, basically, and last analogy week was of like Lone why Depot. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and Lone Depot is huge too. I mean, so yeah, yeah. I mean, that would give the, the Fed and the state more power to additionally, I mean, to regulate. I mean, more government intervention, more regulation. And every time we trade in a comfort to the government that's supposed to bail us out, we lose a freedom. And I mean, I'm, I mean, we're losing free. I mean, and I don't want to get political or anything, and I won't because I, I mean, I don't trust any politicians. I just think there's less to evil. But I mean, I don't know. Like, I'm shocked, Melody. This was never supposed to happen. We had appraisals in place that was supposed to cap value growth, but then we had appraisal gaps. People are like, who cares? Let's just let's just keep inflating prices. I don't understand why people have such a hard time understanding how inflated everything is. And then when you have this massively inflated asset class that's built on a foundation that is just being BS. It's not QM loans. I mean, it's just high debt to income ratios, high defaults, but oh, let's put a moratorium in and let's hide that. And you're just hiding all of these issues. It's good. Yeah. When it happens and it falls apart, Melody, it may fall apart so fast that even bailouts is not going to stop the bad things from happening. It didn't stop it in the GFC. Um, so oh, no. a lot going Let me, on. I just know. want to say something yeah. real quick because did you see that Fannie Mae letter to its appraisers talking about the concessions? So for the people that say you got it wrong, Travis, the problem is we don't have the data yet. And so everybody needs to wait because we're still in the fog of war. And basically Fannie Mae reviewed 7.6 million comparables and found that 58% of the time the appraisals were not taking into consideration the concessions. And yes. we know that the builders have been doing those buy downs. They're not marking that against the price. They're also paying your closing costs. They're also giving you free solar for a year. And so a 15 to 25% net price reduction has been affected that nobody can see in the data. No and so, so, and, and this is, and you can you go ask Fannie Mae. They don't have to trust you and me, Travis. That, that more, that letter to the appraisers just went out in December. So, 58% of the time appraisals were inflated yeah. that they know about. I mean, so, and we also know the lenders were doing buy downs, a lot of the big lenders. So we have no idea what's actually happened to prices over the last year. You know what? I mean, I'm glad that they sent that out, Melody, but too little, too late. We're already in this situation. Right. We're already in this. Right. Like we need, and, and they're still doing it. And I try to tell people, and I'm screaming at the top of the line. I was like, you guys, please, if you don't look, if you don't see the data, you know, price going down turmoil, look at the new construction data. And it's not even all right. reported. It, it's being held back. Right. That data itself is being right. manipulated. I could prove that they're not counting those buy down seller concessions. So right. They usually do uh, right. with a, a contribution towards closing costs, but not the buy downs. And that's 20, 30, 40,000. That could be 10% of value. Exactly. And that's not, I mean, I understand why they're doing it. They're like, oh, well, Lennar Mortgage is not the seller. Even though Lennar owns Lennar Mortgage, you can look it on their books. They're making a tremendous amount of profit. But anyways, Melody, you know, I'm going to cut this swap. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we've been talking about 44 minutes. I want to, I want to kind of move on to our other video we're going to do, but you know, before I go, is there any, anything you want to kind of clear up and any type of, you know, hope you could give to the consumers or, or what's the solution here? And any, what's your last words, Melody? Well, it, you know, the solution is we have to be paying attention. And I think that, you know, this is a very, um, this is going to be a very tumultuous year and there's going to be narratives coming at us from everywhere. Kind of like these winds that you may hear in the background here in Tennessee. Uh, we're, you know, if, if we if you're not paying attention, you're going to end up making a really bad decision. And I'm not saying not to buy a house. What I'm saying, everybody's situation is different. 
you have to look at what's really going on. And if you're if you're forced to do that right now, it would not be my recommendation if you have to take on leverage. If you don't, that's a different conversation. But, you know, just wait. And if you cannot wait, then you actually have most of the negotiating power right now. And I know that your realtor is going to tell you that's not true. And they're going to lie to you about other offers. And they're going to try to, uh, you know, kind of instigate that FOMO by you know, coming soon listings and things like that, where they're marketing in the background. And then they say, Oh, it was, you know, it was sold already. There is a lot of narrative out there. So just, you know, what I would say is, please be paying attention and ask the hard questions. And if you need help, you know, reach out to somebody like Travis or me, and we can talk you through a a specific situation. Yeah, uh, well said, Melody. I mean, the system is designed to take advantage of poor spending habits and decisions of consumers. That is how our decision, uh, that is how our system works. We're a debt driven uh, economy and they will take advantage if you purchase foolishly. And, and I'm not talking like a little bit, they will gouge you to death and lie to your, not all there's, there's, there's some good people. Uh, but I really appreciate your time. Uh, once again, Melody. And again, you guys, you know, show her some love. She didn't have to take all this time to share her perspective with us. Go to her Substack. go to her YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, and from the bottom of my heart, Melody, again, I really appreciate you shining light on this situation. I appreciate you taking your time to help our community here at real estate mindset. So a lot of love for you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us out of here. So if you guys are out there investing in real estate, you know that we both from the bottom of our hearts, wish you luck. You will need it. And both of us, and this is why we're saying we're not celebrating the collapse. We're warning you. We hope you win.